This is an NBC News special report. Here's Lester Holt. Good day. We're coming on the air with breaking news and what will be the official announcement of the retirement of Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer. President Biden is about to speak with Justice Breyer by his side. NBC News was first to report that the 83-year-old justice plans to step down at the end of the current term later this year. Breyer was appointed in 1994. He's the oldest justice on the conservative court and the most senior member of its liberal wing. His retirement gives President Biden the opportunity opportunity to choose the next Supreme Court justice, one he has previously pledged will be the first black woman on the Supreme Court. I want to quickly go to Justice Correspondent Pete Williams, who broke this news yesterday. And Pete, we're learning some more about the timing already of, of his retirement. Right. Justice Breyer is carrying with him his letter of announcing his retirement. And what he says is, I intend to step down when the court rises for the summer recess, which is typically in late June or early July, assuming that by then my successor has been nominated and confirmed. So he says he wants to leave this summer, and it also puts a little pressure on the White House to get this process moving. He also says in the letter that it's been a pleasure to serve on the court for 28 years, that he found the work challenging and meaningful. He says, my relations with each of my colleagues have been warm and friendly, and throughout I've been aware of the great honor of participating as a judge in the effort to maintain our Constitution and rule of law. Somewhat unusual, but not unprecedented for a Supreme Court Justice a hand carry his letter of retirement. We know of this happening twice before in history. Justice Anthony Kennedy did it, so did Harry Blackman, but it is somewhat unusual. Sometimes these letters are just sent up by courier, Lester. Yeah, that, that's the formal part of this, but do we know when the conversation took place when the White House was notified that this retirement was happening? No, we don't know exactly when, but they certainly knew it was coming. They hadn't received the letter until today, but they were well aware of his plans, and they were already planning to do something like this ceremony today. Friends have said that he made this decision within the last couple of weeks, agonizing over it. You know, there was a lot of pressure on him to step down last term, and I think all that pressure simply stiffened his resolve to stay. But now he has decided to go. He's someone who knows this process. He was the staff counsel, the general counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee, so he understands the confirmation process, and he knows that this would be the best chance to have someone appointed while the president, uh, the Democrats, still own the White House and the uh, and the Senate, which will vote on a confirmation. All right, Pete, we are watching the podium. We're expecting the president and Justice Breyer to step up momentarily. Let me go to Kelly O'Donnell, though, who is also at the White House. And Kelly, this will officially trigger the mechanism to find a replacement. How is that going so far? Well, the president has already nominated 40 jurists to the federal bench, so there's already been a robust process to process and look at potential candidates, and among them, eight women to the federal uh, circuit. And we'll pause now for the president and Justice Breyer. Kelly, thank you. Good afternoon. I begin by recognizing both Dr. Breyer Dr. Biden, <laughs> and uh, uh, for being here. And uh, I can't tell you, this is sort of a bittersweet day for me. Uh, Justice Breyer and I go back a long way, all the way back to the mid-70s when he first came on the Judiciary Committee, but that's another story. I'm here today to express the nation's gratitude to Justice Stephen Breyer for his remarkable career of public service and his clear-eyed commitment to making our country's laws work for its people. And uh, our gratitude extends to Justice Breyer's family for being partners in his decades of public service. In particular, I want to thank his wife, jo Dr. Joanne Breyer, who is uh, here today and who has stood by him for nearly six decades, uh, and with her fierce intellect, good humor, and enormous heart. And I thank you. The country owes you as well. And Stephen Breyer's public service started early. He served in the United States Army as a teenager and in all three branches of the federal government before he turned 40. They were the good old days, weren't they? <laughs> and as he was a law clerk at Supreme Court Justice Goldberg, a prosecutor in the Department of Justice, a member of the Watergate prosecution team. And I first met Stephen Breyer when I was a senator on the Judiciary Committee, and uh, he uh, started off as taking care of one of the subcommittees for Teddy, but then became chief counsel 
during his tenure as uh, as uh, Ted's chairman uh, chairmanship of the Judiciary Committee. Beyond his intellect and hard work and legal insight, he was famous for biking across Washington virtually every day for a face-to-face -face meeting with a Republican chief counsel, the ranking Republican counsel. And over breakfast, they discussed what would they do for the country together. Whereas in those days, we tried to do things together. They, uh, the, that spirit stuck with me when I took over the Judiciary Committee as chair after Senator Kennedy's tenure. And uh, it was my honor to vote to confirm Justice Breyer to serve in the United States Supreme Court, or the, the Court of Appeals first, in 1980. And then 14 years later, in 1994, I got to preside as chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee over a Supreme Court confirmation hearings. We were joking with one another when he walked in. Did we ever think that he would have served decades on the court and I'd be president of the United States when the day he came in and retired? I, uh, and he looked at it. Anyway, I, I won't tell you what he said. I'm joking. But I was proud and grateful to be there at the start of this distinguished career in the Supreme Court. And I'm very proud to be here today on his announcement of his retirement. You know, during his confirmation hearings way back in 1994, nominee Stephen Breyer said, quote, the law must work for the people. He explained to us his faith that our complex legal system has a single purpose, tell people who make up our country. It was a different time, of course, but his brilliance, his values, his scholarship are why Judge Breyer became Justice Breyer by an overwhelming bipartisan vote at the time. Today, Justice Breyer announces his intention to step down from active service after four decades, four decades on the federal bench and 28 years on the United States Supreme Court. His legacy includes his work as a leading scholar and jurist in administrative law, bringing his brilliance to bear to make government run more efficiently and effectively. It includes his stature as a beacon of wisdom on our Constitution and what it means. And through it all, Justice Breyer has worked tirelessly to give faith to the notion that the law exists to help the people. Everyone knows that Stephen Breyer has been an exemplary justice. Fair to the parties before him, courteous to his colleagues, careful in his reasoning. He's written landmark opinions on topics ranging from reproductive rights to health care, to voting rights, to patent law, to laws protecting our environment and the laws that protect our religious practices. His opinions are practical, sensible, and nuanced. It reflects his belief that a job of a judge is not to lay down a rule, but to get it right, to get it right. Justice Breyer's law clerks and his colleagues, as many of the press here know, describe him and his work ethic, his desire to learn more, his kindness to those around him, and his optimism for the promise of our country. And he has patiently sought common ground and built consensus, seeking to bring the court together I think he's a model public servant in a time of great division in this country. Justice Breyer has been everything his country could have asked of him. And he's appeared before, when he appeared before the Judiciary Committee almost three decades ago, we all had high hopes for the mark he would leave on the history, the law, and the Constitution. And he's exceeded those hopes in every possible way. Today is his day, our day to commend his and his life of service and his life on the court. But let me say a few words about the critically important work of selecting his successor. Choosing someone to sit in the Supreme Court, I believe, is one of the most serious constitutional responsibility a president has. Our process is going to be rigorous. I will select a nominee worthy of Justice Breyer's legacy of excellence and decency. While I've been studying candidates' backgrounds and writings, I've made no decision except one. The person I will nominate will be someone with extraordinary qualifications, character, experience, and integrity. And that person will be the first black woman ever nominated to the United States Supreme Court. It's long overdue in my view. I made that commitment during the campaign for president, and I will keep that commitment. I will fully do what I said I'd do. I will fulfill my duty to select a justice, not only with the Senate's consent, but with his advice. You've heard me say in other nomination processes that the, the Constitution says seek the advice and consent, but the advice as well of the Senate. I'm going to invite senators from both parties to offer their ideas and points of view.
I'll also consult with leading scholars and lawyers. And I'm fortunate to have advising me in this selection process, Vice President Kamala Harris. She's an exceptional lawyer, former Attorney General of the State of California, former member of the Senate Judiciary Committee. I will listen carefully to all the advice I'm given, and I'll study the records and former cases carefully. I'll meet with the potential nominees, and it is my intention, my intention to announce my decision before the end of February. I have made no choice at this point. Once I select a nominee, I will ask the Senate to move promptly on my choice. In the end, I will nominate a historic candidate, someone who is worthy of Justice Breyer's legacy, and someone who, like Justice Breyer, will provide incredible service on the United States Supreme Court. Justice Breyer, on behalf of all the American people, I want to thank you and your family, and your family for your tremendous service to our nation. And I'm going to yield the floor to you, Mr. Justice. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. President. That was terribly nice. And uh, believe me, I hold it right here. <laughs> it's wonderful. And I, I thought about what I, I might say to you, and I, I'd like to say so, something I enjoy is talking to high school students, grammar school students, college students, even law school students. And, and they'll come around and ask me, what, 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 is the, what is it you find particularly meaningful about your job? What sort of gives you a thrill? And that's not such a tough question for me to answer. Uh, it's the same thing. Day one, almost. <laughs> Up to day, I don't know how many. But, but the, the, what, what I say to them is, look, I sit there on the bench, and after we hear lots of cases, and after a while, the impression, it takes a while, I have to admit, but the impression you get is, you know, as you well know, this is a complicated country. There are more than 330 million people, and my mother used to say it's every race, it's every religion, and she would emphasize this, and it's every point of view possible. And uh, it's a kind of miracle when you sit there and see all those people in front of you, you, you uh, the people that are so different in what they think, and yet they've decided to help solve their major differences under law. And when the students get too cynical, I say, go, go look at what happens in countries that don't do that. And that's there. I can't take this around in my job. But people have come to accept this Constitution, and they've come to accept the importance of a rule of law. And I want to make another point to them. I want to say, look, uh, of course people don't agree, but we have a country that is based on human rights, democracy, and so forth. But I'll tell you what Lincoln thought, what Washington thought, and what people today still think. It's an experiment. It's an experiment. That's what they said. And Joanna paid each of our grandchildren a certain amount of money to memorize the Gettysburg Address. And the, the reason, the reason that, that, that what we want them to pick up there and what I want those students to pick up, if I can remember the first two lines, is that four, four score and seven years ago our fathers brought up... Uh, created upon this uh, uh, here a new country, a country that was dedicated uh, to uh, liberty and the proposition that all men are created equal, conceived in liberty, those are his words, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. He meant women, too. And uh, we are now engaged in a great civil war to determine whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. See, those are the words I want. To see an experiment. And that's what he thought. It's an experiment. And I found some letters that George Washington wrote where he said the same thing. It's an experiment. That experiment existed then because even the liberals in Europe, you know, they're looking over here and they say it's a great idea in principle, but it'll never work. Uh, but we'll show them it does. That's what Washington thought. And that's what Lincoln thought. And that's what people still think today. And I say, well, I want you, and I'm talking to the students now. I say, I want you to pick just this up. It's an experiment that's still going on. And I'll tell you something. You know who will see whether that experiment works? It's you, my friend. 
It's you, Mr. High School student. It's you, Mr. College student. It's you, Mr. Law School students. It's us, but it's you. It's that next generation and the one after that. My grandchildren and their children. They'll determine whether the experiment still works. And of course, I am an optimist and I'm pretty sure it will. Does it surprise you that that's the thought that comes into my mind today? I don't know, but thank you. Doctor, I don't know that you've ever been to the White House in the Lincoln bedroom, but I invite both of you to come and stay. And the Lincoln bedroom has, against the wall between the windows looking out, a handwritten copy of the Gettysburg Address written by Lincoln in that bedroom, allegedly, or the, the sitting room. And so you got to come and see it. And even if you can't come and say, bring your grandchildren so they can see it as well. Thank you all so very, very much for being here. And I'm not going to take any questions because I think it's inappropriate to uh, take questions uh, with the justice here. He's still sitting on the bench. And I'm going to give you a mask. Uh, but uh, you'll have plenty of opportunities to get me later today and for the rest of the week, the next week, too. So thank you very much. Thank you. Things happen to the moment. Sir, what will it mean to you to pick the first black woman on the court? Thank you, Mr. President. President Biden not taking any questions as he said he would not as he leaves the rooms. Uh, Stephen Breyer uh, formally acknowledging his plans to retire uh, at uh, likely at the end of June from his uh, seat on the U.S. Supreme Court. I want to go to Justice Correspondent Pete Williams now. Pete, uh, the president gave us a, a lot of information there that he plans to announce uh, a nomination by the end of February. He affirmed his campaign promise to select an African-American woman. Uh, quite a field to choose from. Yes, and I think it's pretty clear that he hasn't decided who he'll nominate because uh, we think the White House is still reaching out to sort of community groups, affinity groups, asking them if there are any nominations, any potential nominees that they haven't thought of. The two leading contenders, of course, Katanji Brown Jackson, who's a federal appeals court judge here in Washington, took the position that was vacated by Merrick Garland when he became attorney general, a former law clerk to Justice Breyer, so she knows the Supreme Court well. The other, Leandra Kruger, a justice on the California Supreme Court. Another former U.S. Supreme Court law clerk to John Paul Stevens. And during the Obama administration, one of the government's top appellate lawyers, she's argued a dozen cases before the Supreme Court. So I think those are have to be considered leader, leader contenders, but other names will undoubtedly be brought to the president and then he'll make a decision. I think, Lester, today we saw the professorial side of Stephen Breyer. Uh, you know, he loves to talk about history. He loves to talk about civics. He's written several books. And it's probably just as well that he didn't pick up on something the president talked about because one thing that Stephen Breyer has never mastered is that contraption known as the bicycle because yes it's true he did bike all over Washington but he also was severely injured at least three times in bike accidents he broke his collarbone he broke his ribs he fractured his shoulder and had to have surgery and finally I think he's decided to hang his bicycle up I have to tell you though I enjoyed his you talked about his professorial side that was an interesting lecture essentially reprising what he tells young people, clearly someone who loves the law and, as you know, loves history. Yes, and in, in, in one of the few justices who likes to talk about his work and publicly, when Antonin Scalia was still on the bench, the two of them would go out and do just about any public group that would ask them to talk about their differing uh, attitudes toward how you interpret the Constitution. Scalia, the originalist, said you have to look at what the Founding Fathers would have said. Breyer, very much a person who believed that the law has consequences, that Supreme Court decisions have to apply to people, and they have to be more practical. And he loves to talk about that and write books about it. All right, Pete, thank you. Let me go to Kelly O'Donnell at the White House. And Kelly, the president noted that he wants to take advice uh, for members of the Senate to, to, to process a lot of information. Is there a concerted effort by this White House to make this inherently political process appear to be less political? 
Well, he is taking a line right from the Constitution, the advice and consent of the Senate, and perhaps having been a chair of the Judiciary Committee, he understands that. And by trying to bring in senators, both of his own party and perhaps some who are Republicans, hoping perhaps to expand beyond his own party, to get a few votes on the Republican side, which in the world of Supreme Court nominations is not unheard of, that would also uh, fortify this nominee and her place in history. And so trying to take some of the heat off. Uh, this is always a volatile process, and it certainly will be in this case. But it is also, it seems, the president trying to lay out that while he has set a marker of a historic choice, a black woman jurist, he is not taking away from that all of the important things of reviewing the qualifications and making certain constituencies are heard on this. The timing is critical, too, because it was on February 25th during the campaign season that he made that that pledge as candidate Biden to make the first uh, appointment of a black woman on the Supreme Court if he became president and if there were a vacancy. So that could be a date to watch. And also this, the State of the Union address has been set for March 1st. So the president is giving himself a chance to have an important historical moment before that big address to a joint session of Congress and the nation. So he's giving himself a timeline. He is sort of sending the message to all the interest groups out there. There will be a chance for their voices to be heard, and he's reinforced that no decision has been made and that a careful process will take place. As this was getting underway, I was saying to you he's already placed 40 nominations and had those judges confirmed to the federal bench. Eight of them have been women to the circuit level, so he has a deep reservoir of knowledge of potential candidates and a process that has been working inside the White House. Of course, when you're talking about the Supreme Court, it amps it up to another level. Uh, but this White House has experience with people who've worked on the Judiciary Committee and the unusual circumstance of a president who led the process when he was a senator and now has this historic place for himself, one of the purest powers of the presidency to change the country for a long time, expanding beyond his own time in office. All right, Leslie. Kelly, thank you. I'll ask you to stand by as I go to our colleague, Garrett Hake, who covers Capitol Hill. And Garrett, a lot of the early conversation was around this 50-50 split in the Senate, the possibility of the vice president of breaking a tie. That's based upon the notion that they'll get no Republican votes for a Biden nominee. Is that a given? I don't think it is, Lester. For example, Ketanji Brown Jackson, the judge who's been the focus of so much speculation when she was nominated to the seat she currently holds, she got three Republican votes. Susan Collins of Maine, Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, and Lindsey Graham of South Carolina all supported her for lower court position. Now, that's no guarantee that they would support her for the Supreme Court, but it does suggest that that possibility exists. And in my conversations with lawmakers, aides, activists, already already starting to work on this confirmation process. There's an acknowledgement from some of the Republicans I talked to that this is a pick that won't change the ideological composition of the Supreme Court, and one in which it appears Democrats will likely have the votes to put on the bench regardless. So you might see a couple of Republicans cross over and support what would be a historic selection. Yeah, and the, the president says he'll have a pick by the end of February. In terms of looking in the calendar, does that give them, uh, Democrats, the time they need uh, uh, obviously, I know everyone's keeping an eye on the midterm elections. Yeah, more than enough time to get this done by the midterms. The average for the currently serving justices is about two and a half months from nomination to confirmation. But the most recent justice, Amy Coney Barrett, was confirmed in less than a month after her nomination was made public. So it's entirely possible if the president keeps to his end of February timeline for nomination, he could have a new justice in place by even the end of March. Uh, let me go to, uh, thank you, Gary. Let me go to back to Pete Williams. And, and Pete, in terms of the, the president, he said he would interview view candidates we assume not not everyone uh, but but typically how many will uh, a president talk to before making a choice well, usually three or four uh, of the top contenders will come in and talk to the president, and that can be an important factor. Now, they all say they don't have litmus tests for Supreme Court nominees, and I'm sure uh, that President Biden will say the same. They won't ask them how they'll rule on specific cases, but I think that they probably will have a pretty rigorous process. And one of the reasons why, Lester, they like judges as Supreme Court nominees is that judges have records. They look back through their decisions. They know the opposition will do that as well, and they hope that by choosing people that have judicial records, there will be fewer surprises at confirmation hearings. 
Pete Williams, thank you. So again, Justice Breyer formally uh, offering a letter to the president announcing his retirement uh, at the beginning of the summer. Uh, and the search will now uh, formally get underway as President Biden looks to make his selection. What he promises will be a black woman. That concludes our special report. I'll have much more tonight on NBC Nightly News. I'm Lester Holt in New York. Thank you for watching. Good day.